being the founding pastor here at Engage. We are in a series called Redefining Existence. We have a, 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 a kind of a, a tradition here at Engage that throughout the summer we go through a book of the Bible and we've decided to go through the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to pull up this quote by Tim Mackey, um, who actually defines the book of Ephesians this way. Ephesians is an essay summarizing the most apocalyptic event in history, Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the gift of the Spirit to bring new creation right here in the present world. This idea of apocalyptic event, we learned last week that word apocalypse, um, as much as it may uh, spark in your mind, the book of Revelation or fire or the end of the world, actually apocalypse just simply means revelation. It's taking something that is seen and uh, that's unseen and making it seen. And Paul's entire life was based on this apocalyptic event. It's when he met Jesus. And so the book of Ephesians is all about Paul writing to the church at Ephesus about how this apocalyptic event behind the scenes of what it meant, but also now how does it practically play out in actual real life. And so that's what this is all about. And it's the whole thing about redefining existence. And so today I decided to be just super, just calm. And, and we're going to talk about the title of my sermon today. It's called I Identify. Okay? I Identify. So we're going to dive in. We're going to have uh, hopefully fun as we go through this process uh, today. But this word identity um, has become central in our culture today. It has become a central word, which means it's become really a central, really a theme in our culture. Whether if it is people, this idea of identifying politically, whether if it's Republican or Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian, For us, identifying with sexuality and gender of straight or gay, male, female, binary, non-binary, and on and on. Or when we get to our actual gaps now that we identify with when it comes to actual generations, right? So people no longer, Gen Z wears that badge like no one else. I'm in Gen Z. They want the whole world to know they're in Gen Z. And we love you all because you're in Gen Z, all right? You're all very special. Millennials, you know, you got your bean bags and your hoodies and all that stuff at work, and you're great. And boomers, you're just angry. Uh, we get that. And then Gen X, which is just the best generation ever because it's mine, all right? So, no, we identify in those things. And, and, and here's the truth is that because it's become central, it's now become contentious. It's one of the central words and central things in our culture, but now it's become a contentious thing to where division lies. Things have happened to where actually when we talk about this, that it's leading to things that I, that I personally believe are tearing at certain things of the fabric, really, of, of culture and society. And in the fall, we're going to talk and go deeper into even the, the realities of sexuality and the impact of that. We're going to talk about that. But what I want to do today is I want us to go behind the veil to go a little bit deeper because what we can do is get caught in the culture war. We can get caught in all the different things, and and I think there's things that we need to talk about and have a very clear stance on in the church, but I want to go beyond that. I want to go to the basement because I think if we can get to the origin of something, you can actually fix it. Just like a doctor, when a doctor comes in to actually help you, they're trying to get to the source of whatever the problem is. They're just not dealing many times just with the symptoms. They're trying to get to the source. And, And see, here's my thing. When you get through all of it, when you get through the, 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 really the weeds and just the, 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 uh, just the words and everything that is happening in culture, underneath it all, it's just people crying out for a sense of purpose, identity, and belonging. That's the cry. Whether if it's politically, if it's sexual, uh, sexual in nature, or gender, Generationally, job, it doesn't matter. At the end, what the cry is and what I, what I want us to do as a, as a church and my job as a pastor is to get us to actually see behind all the stuff. Because when you see behind all the stuff, and many times what can happen, we can go in and become a people who pray, believe, but also a people who have empathy and are people willing to dive in. And with having empathy means that doesn't mean you're, you void, you're void of truth, but you actually have compassion and a direction because at the, at the essence of everything, it comes out that people just want identity and they want belonging. And see, the Apostle Paul, let me say this, nothing has changed in thousands of years. Every generation, every culture has dealt with this. Every culture has dealt with this reality of identity. 
it just plays out different. Technology has made this play out a little bit different. But this is no different than what happened when Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. As we're going to read today, as he's writing to this church, he, identity is in the forefront of it. Of where should this church now find their identity? Because Paul knew this, that our identity's origin will govern the course of our lives. I'm going to say again, our identity's origin will govern the course of our lives. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to read in Ephesians, but what we're going to do, I want you to kind of listen. I'm going to read, and I could make up something. I was going to make up something, but I didn't think that was the right thing. I actually gave the sound booth the wrong scripture. And so I could say, oh man, I want you guys to just embody it. That wasn't it, okay? So I'm just, I want you to read and just listen to it today, all right? If you have a Bible on your phone or something else, you pull that out too, okay? You know, I know that's a, you know, so I'll make you work a little bit today. Normally, you know, it pops up on the big Bible behind me. So here we go. We're going to read in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. Now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much, God, for who you are. Father, we are grateful for your death, and we are grateful for your resurrection. And so today we say, come Holy Spirit, reveal God the Father, reveal Jesus the Son. We love you and we honor you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In the back, just so you guys know the timer, let's make sure we get that. Just okay. I just want to make sure because you guys know if you don't give me a timer, I will be up here all day long. All right. So some of y'all are like, please, man, I got to go to brunch, dude. All right. So, um, <laughs> see, this idea of identity and that it will govern the course of our lives. Paul writing to this church at Ephesus, this is really important because this is a hotbed of all type of worship, was the church at Ephesus. Because it was under Roman rule, Caesar's worship was central there in Ephesus. But also, when the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis was there, there was all different types of other worship of other gods and other deities that actually impacted the lives of people, how they identified themselves, what they did with their lives, how it played out. And so Paul, as he's writing to this church, he, he's, this is a letter that's penned to them, and this letter would get passed around, not just only to that church, but surrounding churches. He starts off by talking about if you are now in Christ, for those who believed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he's saying this is where your identity lies. Because Paul understood the origin of your identity will govern the course of your life. And what's sad sometimes is many of us don't know what the origin of our identity is. We think the origin of our identity at times, yes, we will say it's in Christ until you actually watch your life and how your life plays out. Because remember, your identity's origin will govern where you're going. It will set the course of how you're moving. And sometimes I think people have well-meaning intentions of what they say governs their life until you actually begin to watch it. It is so easy for politics, and it's so easy for money and power. It's so easy for titles to become a thing that becomes the center of our lives. And I think a lot of people are well-meaning. They don't mean for that to happen, but it actually happens. 
And so what we have to do is get to the source because it's easy right now to look at everyone else in this world today and look at them and try to find out the source of their identity instead of saying, what's the source of mine? What is the source of the identity of this church? What is the source of identity right now, you as a parent in this room? Is the source in your identity the accomplishment of your kids or your kids just doing right and wrong? We sh- and listen, and none of those things are bad, but when that becomes the source of our identity, we're going to learn today that it does not go well. There's two primary places that you're going to find. That's it, where you're going to get your identity from. It's either the created or the creator. That is it. In today's world, everybody will say it's a lot of stuff. It's not. It's two things, the created or the creator. Now, Paul really does address this in a more profound way in the book of Romans. So I actually have that scripture for you guys. You don't have to pull that out today. But we're going to read in Romans chapter 1 as Paul talks about this. Romans 1, let's pull that up. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks as they began to think of foolish ideas what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. Let me just stop you. This is just free game for you today, okay? You know when people talk about the judgment of God? The judgment of God is when God lets his hand off and lets you do what you want. A lot of times we need the judgment of God. Like, man, this is the judgment is coming. No, no, no. The judgment of God is when he takes his hands off and lets you do whatever you want. And we'll find out why in a second. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And this is the important part. I want you to see this. Because we're going to read this. And we're going to go behind this point, And then everybody's anxiety is going to get up. But I want you to see this. So they worship and serve things God created instead of the creator himself. We're going to keep this up. When I say created, it's anything that's made out of what already has existed. Do you understand that it's said from the dust of the ground that God formed humans? From what was already made, God created. So we are a part of the created. So the phones that we have, to the cars that we drive, to the ideologies today, that we ascribe to, whether if it is libertarianism or if it is socialism, all those things are man-made. They are part of the created. And it's because they decided to take the created instead of worshiping the creator. I want us to hear that, and I want our anxiety to be down, because we read this, and what we're going to read next, then everybody's going to flip out, all right? Here we go. That is why God abandoned their shameful eye, even though women turned against natural ways to have sex instead and indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. And men did shameful things with other men. As a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it's foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wicked. Now, I want us to see this. He talks about sexual relations, and then he goes to the other stuff. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. Gossip is always the one that gets thrown in. Like, gossip is a part of this, and so we'll move on. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. Word. They refuse to understand the break, and they break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice required that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now, we read this in the Bible, and there's a lot of different feelings and thoughts about this. But what I want us to get to is what we've been saying, is getting to the basement. Because the basement of what Paul is writing in this book is this. He's writing the fact of they change worship of the creator into worship of the created. And he said, when this happened, the deconstruction of humanity starts to happen. See, when created is the source of our identity, created goes and deconstructs. This is what the Bible teaches. And I'm telling you, just reading, I study history. This is what happens. When the created becomes the source, it always goes and it deconstructs. And here's the thing. And I'm going to pull this quote up really quick. 
Next one. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Next one. We got it. We got it. We got it. Nope, the next one. Here we go. There we go. When we become the source of our own identity, our innate desires to contribute to creation, yet paradoxically, we subtract from it. Our identity, the human nature, is to add to creation. But when we become the source, what do we do? We actually tear it down. We deconstruct. And that's why Paul talks about from relationships to greed to murder to what? We deconstruct. What Paul is comparing this to, Romans 1, is a comparison to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 was what? God the creator made and created. Romans 1 is human beings try to misplace God, put themselves in the center, and they deconstruct humanity. And this is incredibly important because we see this in Genesis chapter 3. See, in Genesis chapter 3, what happens next is that human beings do what? They put on fig leaves. See, three, seven, so Genesis 3, 7 says this. As the moment their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. From that moment, human beings begin to do this, that when sin entered the world, now we just try to cover ourselves. So we cover ourselves with our jobs and our titles when we go somewhere, and we find real identity in that. So people ask you, what do you do? Like, I mean, some of you right now, you are, you maybe felt that you weren't supposed to go to college, and you went to college because you were really embarrassed because you know that they make the, you know, depending on what type of school you go to, they're going to make the announcement of everybody's college they go to, and you didn't want to be the person to say, I'm taking a gap year. You didn't want to be that guy, that girl. You wanted to be someone that says, no, I'm going to this school, this school, this school. Why? Because it's a fig leaf. Not that it's wrong, but it's a fig leaf to cover up what? To show me that I am someone. And we can go on and on about stuff that we cover ourselves up with. And when humanity does this, when this becomes the source, it begins to destroy creation. Let me give you one that's really personal to me, is that when my blackness begins to be elevated over everything else, here's what happens. If my blackness becomes elevated, though I am, listen, my black skin is a part of the created. But when my black skin becomes the sense and source of my identity, at all costs, what will happen? I will do what? At the expense of others, I will lift up others that look like me. And here's the thing, and some of you are going to struggle with this, that is deconstructing humanity because this thing that's not being a blessing to the nations is that because I begin to now push others down, we've experienced that in our country. See, when you begin to understand this, We begin to now unravel creation. We begin to unravel creation today with nationalism. When it's us versus them. It's America the Great versus all the other evil empires. But last time I checked, America is just still Babylon. Though I love this country and I live this country, I don't want to go anywhere else. And You guys have heard me say it. But this is still just the best iteration of Babylon. This is not the promised land. This is not God's chosen place. This is just another world empire. And so when nationalism gets mixed and meshed with Christianity, what do we do? It's us versus them. And instead of Christians being a blessing to the nations, what we do is we're dividing now. When this soup and this thing of nationalism and Christian, they, they start to mix together, it deconstructs. And so where do you find your identity? Where do you find your identity? And I want to ask you, and you find your identity, is it building the world or is it deconstructing the world? See, this is the question that we all must answer. And this is the question that we all must answer right now. In this current moment, right now. Because if we do not, we will not be a source of actually helping the world. We will continue to be a part of it. And here's the scary thing. We don't even realize we're doing it. I'm just standing up for what's right. Well, here's what's interesting when you're standing up for what's right. When your source of identity is the created, then you begin to define what is right. I want you... When you are the source of identity, now what happens? You now define what is right and what is wrong. And when you define what is right and what's wrong, normally it fits the grid of actually what you want. That is why people could enslave human beings and justify the Bible to do it. Because why? Because of money, finance, all of this, power became the central thing of identity. And since it became the central thing of identity, it didn't matter. We can just justify why. We can find scripture in the Bible to say why this happened. And the ones that did talk about it, we just cut that out. 
which is a true story. And I could go on and on, and I know some of you, well, okay, pastor, you go, again, black man, you talk about slavery and all this. And what else you want me to talk about? I talk about anything else. Because here's the thing. If I'm being really honest in our current world right now, the sense of identity of our nation is freedom. And we are just living in the results of when you just let humans have all the freedom in the world. Now, I want you to hear me in that. I am not saying that, you know, that we should have this big, everybody's in here and we're controlled. No, no, no. But I want you to know that was the experiment. It's freedom. And now what are we living in? Freedom. But freedom should always be used for the, for the pulling up of everyone else, not just to do whatever the hell you want to do. Because that is what freedom has turned into across the board. It don't matter what political spectrum, it is just to do. Don't touch my guns, don't touch my money, don't touch my body. And here's what happens. It is deconstructing humanity. So now we have to go to Paul. So if the created is the thing, if the created becomes a sense of origin of identity, then what does it look like when the creator is a sense of origin and identity? Let's pull up what Paul writes in Ephesians. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. I could stay there all day. Before he made the world, God loved us. And he chose us in Christ, not in anything else, but in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is, this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. We're going to talk about that later in the series, but do you ever think about that it gave God great pleasure to choose you? Like, it gave, like I want you to think about something that gives you great pleasure. Like parents in this room, maybe, hopefully, like when you give, like when there's something that your kids have wanted, and you give it to them, and you see their excitement about it, it should give you great pleasure. Or man, when you get a gift or somebody says something to you and it, it, it gives them great, it gives you great pleasure. That's how God thought about when he chose us. Now let's go to the next passage. God's purpose, this is verse 12 of what we just read. God's purpose was that we Jews who were first to trust in Christ will bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Paul writing to this church says that now that if you've believed in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, your identity is now in Christ. That the creator is now your source of identity. See, Paul's writing, there's a lot of strong theological words here. The idea of chosen and predestined. People have formed, we form all types of theologies around this. But what we miss sometimes is that we think when Paul's writing this, he's just only writing it just to us. But Paul's writing to people who have, would have understood the entire arc of the story. When Paul's writing to him, that's why he says that, that God would choose the Jewish people first. He is saying that from the many, he chose the one. That from the many of all of Israel, from the many, he chose the one and that one was Jesus. And he's saying that I chose Jesus and choosing Jesus now, you all are now back now to win the many to do what? To go be a blessing to the nations. Going back to Genesis chapter 12. So why does this matter for us to find our identity in creator? It's because when your identity is in creator, what you will do is to go be a blessing to the nations and not deconstruct the world. The origin rooted in your, your origin of your story, when it's rooted in Christ, it knows no boundaries. Meaning this is that when the creator is your source, you can freely give because it doesn't run out. See, when you are the created, you know you got limits. I don't care how great you think you are. Everybody in here knows at some point in time, you got limits. I don't care how much you think, man, I could talk to anybody, convince anybody. Fellas, I know you think Riz is at an all-time high. Some of you don't know what that is. It's okay, Ash, you're Gen Z. I didn't know until I asked my kids, but here's the thing, though. But 
I could talk to this person. Of course, she's going to like me. <laughs> I look good, talk good, smell good. Of course, you're going to talk to me. Let Michael B. Jordan walk in. <laughs> what you realize, there's limits to what you got. <laughs> there's just limits. There are limits to what we have. Have you ever been there where you thought you were really smart? And then somebody else come in, you're like, oh, shoot. You're like, oh, oh, shoot. There are limits. And see, here's what you need to know. When there's limits to humans, then this is what we do. We hoard and we keep because we don't know where it's going to come from. Versus realizing, so you know there's a limit there. But when you're in the creator, you know that that knows no bounds. So you can freely go give. And when you know where your identity is at, I don't need humanity to define me anymore. I don't need your approval to define me. I don't need your approval to say that I am somebody. Though, let me tell you this. It's human beings. It feels good to be encouraged. But if you're waiting for all that's all, it it defines your life as your encouragement. You will sit there and wait and you'll just live your life for someone to encourage you or for someone to tell you who you are. But when you are in Christ, now all of a sudden I can walk in a different manner. I can live in a different manner. I can freely give in a different manner knowing that it will not run out. That who I am will not run out. This is an abundant world that we live in. But sometimes we live as, man, like, that is why sometimes we talk about, well, I don't know, people can't give this. And I, and I just read my Bible, and I read the life of Paul. And at the end of Paul's life, he says this to Timothy as he's in jail, going to die, that I've run my race, I've kept the faith, I've, I'm empty, I've poured my life out like a drink offering. Paul knew that the source of life and the source of being able to live a life fulfilled is to empty yourself. Why? It's because it goes back to the Genesis mandate of being a blessing to the nations. Church, why we have to become and find our identity in Christ is because the places and spaces you dwell right now are waiting and longing for you to come to be a blessing to them. When you go to work, are you a blessing to that nation? Or when you go to work, you're like, oh, Oh, God, you got me in hell. There's no way I can bless this place. You forget, God, you are forsaken it. My boss is Pharaoh. Let your people go. Like, <laughs> But then you read the Bible, and... There was a reason why Jesus, when he would walk on water, it just wasn't like, just to be like, you know, look, fam, I'm really him. All right, so let me just walk on water. Sure. He would do those things to show the world this part. It was to show the world this, that there was no place on earth that's outside of my domain. They thought during those times that actually the water in the sea was that was just where the realm of the demonic. That was the realm of the other gods. We can't go there. And when Jesus walks on water, he does it such in this effortless way to show them there is not a place in this planet. There's not a place in this world that does not belong to me. And so I want you to know there's not a place in this earth that does not belong to God. And what God does is he's asking who will go for me? Who will be the men and women that will find their identity within me and go to these places? Why does that matter? When your identity is in Christ, you're going to face persecution. You're going to face those who may not like you. You're going to, people are going to question things about you. It's going to be hard at times. It's going to be, you feel like you're just knocking against a wall at times. But when your identity is in Christ, you know your life is not your own. And so you go and you go and you go and you're a blessing to the nations. So where's your identity? What governs the course of your life today? Where do you identify? Because in any part of your life that you identify in the created, I'm going to tell you where that story ends. It never ends well. It always ends with human beings being disappointed. And unfortunately, when we don't stop to critically think about our lives, we will go down a course and as we've heard Dr. Zoda say, well, we don't make the unconscious conscious, we will call it fate and it'll rule our lives. When you go down a course of not governing and, or sorry, listen to your life of where your identity is, 
you will go down a course and have no idea how you got there. And the sad thing is you actually think that you're advancing God's kingdom when actually you're deconstructing the world. So where's your identity today? So I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been thinking a lot about this because of my own personal life right now. See, I'm, I'm getting close to like, I'm 44. So like I'm getting close to like halftime, hopefully. So when you get close to halftime, it makes you think about a lot of stuff. You know what I'm saying? When you're young, you're like, oh, it's all young and free. When you're like, yo, man, like I may have less time on the earth than I, you're like, oh, shoot, what am I? It makes you think of walking through some health stuff this year. It makes you think, where is my source of identity? And I can be honest with you. For me, many times my source of identity to have to fight with it being in Christ and not is on the accomplishments that I actually do in the world. And here's the thing. A lot of the stuff I'm doing is for God's kingdom. But see, the origin and source is I want to do this for I want to do this so honestly I can get the applause of people to say, look how good you are, even though it's the kingdom of God stuff. And even in that, it may add some value, but deep inside is deconstructing even me. What's the source of your identity? And see, as we come to a close today, that is the place where all human beings have to get to. What is going to govern your life? You think of the life of Jesus. One of the most, if not the most profound moment in Jesus' life, to me. There will be theologians who would argue with this. But the most profound moment to me in Jesus' life, outside of his death and resurrection, was this, is Jesus' baptism. Because at Jesus' baptism, what happens, you see it in the book of Mark. It says that Jesus gets baptized. It says that heaven tears open. And it says, God speaks to him. This is my son. With him, I am well pleased. Jesus lived his life, his entire life, knowing who he belonged to. That's why when they would mock him, that's why when they would challenge his authority, it didn't faze him because he knew the origin of who he was. In church, we have to get this. We have to get this for the world that we're heading in, and we have to get this for this moment. If we're going to be innovative reconcilers that go out there and change the world, we have to know where our identity lies. And so I'm going to give us a chance. We're going to pray in this moment right now, and I want to give us a chance to really think about this, and maybe your identity has been in some other stuff, but it would give you a chance to actually to respond in the right way, in the proper way to Jesus. And, and, and maybe it's not in the things that I talked about earlier. Maybe it's not in the... Um, in our identity being in, in politics and sexuality. Maybe it's in our job, in our career, in our marriages or our parenting. But wherever that identity is, what I want to encourage you with is that is if it's not in Christ, that you would flip and change. And you'd be willing to make the creator the source of really your life. So Father, I thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you for everyone that's here. And God, I just pray right now God, I pray that we would become a people that our source is really in you. And so if that is you and you're saying, you know what, that is me. I want my source to originate in Christ. I just want you to lift your hand so I can pray with you today. And God bless you and God bless you and God bless you. Listen, and God bless you that this is where you want your source to originate. And so here's what I want to do. If you're responding right now, I just want you to talk and say that to God. Where you need to repent. Repentance is a, is a 180 degree turn from where you were walking to now where you're actually going to a different direction. And what you would do is say, God, I'm sorry. I have found my identity in this thing. But now I turn to you and you ask him, say, God, I want my identity to be in you. I want my identity to be in Christ. Just like Paul. Just like Paul wrote that we are now in Christ. And he identified us as his own. Father, I pray that whatever those things are, whatever those things may be, that God, that you would see and you would move and you would have your way in these people's lives. 
Father, let us be a church that become a blessing to the nation. That's the whole point of this entire thing is for us to be a blessing to the nation, God. God, begin to give us wisdom, begin to give us insight of what that means and what that looks like. We love you, we honor you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, if you don't mind standing to your feet, and I'm going to encourage you to worship with us now. 